Welcome back, my friends, to another adventure in the life of the old-time rock and roller. Today I will be setting the time machine back to 1978 so we can uncover all of the happenings in Los Angeles. And this is where our story will begin. Since I had moved to LA, I had always tried to balance a triangle between love music, and exercise. When I got back from the USO tour of Asia, I realized the sex, drugs, and rock and roll in Hollywood were going to wipe me out if I didn't have more discipline. So I joined the South Bay Hungar Tiger Crane Kung Fu School. The Sifu was Richard Cunningham. He was the first white man, the Guaylo, that Grandmaster John S.S. Leon from Seattle, Washington had taught. Now my Sifu worked in the shipyards and he was pretty tough and he was a black belt in karate. And when he saw Kung Fu, he said, ah, oh, this looks easy. Let me go check it out. Well, he stayed with Master Leong. He didn't leave, he gave up karate. And he stayed with Master Leong for many, many years until he was Sifu. And he moved down to Redondo Beach in Los Angeles. So we got back from the USO tour, Rob Roberti, the drummer, Steve Fishman, the bass player, and myself, we all started up at the school. We went three days a week, no matter what. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturday morning. It was a great time. It was really hard work. I mean, all I had done was play the guitar, so I was completely out of shape. And I tell you what, the first year you experience flab turning to muscle, and you turn the muscle into steel. It's pretty incredible. We had a lot of cool outings. We went up to the Redwood National Forest once and we camped out, probably 30 of us, right next to the Hells Angels. They had probably had 200 of them. And we were up on the rocks and we were working out at 6 a.m. They didn't bother us at all. It was really cool. Another outing we had, see Hing Pete, my big brother, and I got up early on a Friday morning and drove all the way from Redondo Beach to Seattle, Washington. Straight to Master Leong's school in Chinatown. And we worked out with his students and we were paired up according to our rank and skill level. Neither school wanted to be outdone so we were severely bruised at the end of the night. But Master Leong invited us up to his house for tea and we met his wife and it was a very gracious offering of him. So they had some students who were willing to put me and Pete up and we went back to their house and talked for a while in the big forest out there. Well, we had to be up early for a demo in Chinatown. And just so you know, Sifu means teacher. If you happen to be a master and you're the teacher, then you call him master. So myself and Pete were part of the crowd control. And the school did the lion dance and Master Leong did his Qigong iron thread form and prepared and put the five steel rods in his throat. And he invited somebody from the audience up to come up and, and poke his throat while we were standing there. I got a picture of that, I'll show you. And that was a fabulous time. At the end of the demo, then we went to a big banquet and drank ungape, some kind of wild whiskey. It was a great time and then Pete and I left 
right after the banquet and drove all night long back to LA. That was a great time, incredible. Another time, Sifu was just a regular guy. Outside of class, there was a bar next to the school and on some Thursday nights, he'd invite us there for a beer. One night he had a giant party at his house. Actually, it went all day and all of the students were there. He had a couple of kegs of beer. He was a great guy, God rest his soul. Sifu Richard Cunningham, Kit, Dave Chesney, Dave Bowen, Pierre, Pedro, Gary, Lex, Pete, all of my friends, Lori. Man, that was just a great school. So that was a fabulous experience and it helped guide me into the future. In the school was a guy named Mark Singer. Now Mark went on to become the Beastmaster in the movies. So I could almost call this the Beastmaster connection. So I studied with Sifu and right up until I left Los Angeles. So I, I had the physical thing going on and your mind will tell you anything it wants to hear, but if you can train your body en enough, you can forge your mind in the iron of your own will, to quote a Bruce Lee movie. So I had that going on, it was great, and I loved it. Now, the next thing was the love angle. Terry and I had been together for a while, but I knew something was going on and there were some problems. So I wrote a song called Not Another Girl. There's not another girl I've been dreaming of. And it was like, when did our love go wrong? So I'll play a little bit of that. Sitting in a silent mood Trying to communicate Love never waits you Get it then you lose control Telling me we're not the same Love is grown strange Saturday, was it Saturday? Like me. Where did I love go wrong? There's not another girl that I've been dreaming of. Where did I love go wrong? There's not another girl in the whole wide world. Where did I love and go Yeah, that was pretty good. What do you think? Well, the singer was Mark Aubin. Now, when we got back from Asia, Rob's cousin George, who was a roadie at Studio Instrument Rentals, and he used to tell us stories. He said one night he was setting up for Lol George and Little Feet, and George had a gram of some beautiful Peruvian flake and he poured out a giant line on a mirror and then all of the rest of the stash was over here. So Lowell came in and he said, hey Lowell, you want a toot? And Lowell said, sure. And cousin George handed him a straw and he said, no, I got my own. And he pulled a spark plug wrench out of his back pocket and in one sniff, he sniffed up the whole gram that was on the mirror. George kind of went, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So work was slow. I heard that Muddy Waters, when, when the music was slow, he drove a taxi, he sometimes did some painting, odd jobs. Well, this was no different. So I picked up the LA style and I looked for jobs 
and I saw one that looked like something maybe I could handle. It was manager of a nude massage parlor. So I went down and I interviewed for the job and of course I got the job. And let me tell you, it was very interesting to see how that business works. And after work, at closing times, some of the girls would want to party a little bit and you know, who could argue with that? Steve Jablecki and I were reunited for one final month of gigs. As you recall, the Wadsworth Mansion broke up, Slingshot broke up, I went my way with the Kathy McDonald band and Silver Platinum and Gold, and Steve had just been bumming around out in the valley. We got a call from a drummer who had a bass player and he had one month booked at the best Western in Yuma, Arizona. Talk about the end of the earth. I called Steve and asked him if he wanted to do it and he said, sure. So we learned their songs and we drove down there. It was so hot there. We'd get up at nine in the morning to try and play tennis at the hotel. And it would be about 106, you could fry an egg on the sidewalk. Well, we went through the month. I think I'd go home every other weekend and maybe Terry came down. There was a vicious sandstorm once, like you see over in Saudi Arabia and stuff. You just see this wall of sand and we had to pull the car over and just hunker down. It was intense. Every Everything was just sand, we had to blast our way out of it. So the month ended at the Best Western, but one night we had finished playing and I had a little red Columbia and a little cocaine and I had my Echoplex and little amp, my pig nose, in the hotel room. And Steve and I shared a room and the bass player and the drummer shared a room and so our walls connected. Well, I was playing along to Robin Trower's Bridge of Sighs and I had this echo thing going and it was like... And the echo would keep building tracks and repeating as I went. I played it for about a half an hour and then got tired and went to bed. Well, the next day at breakfast, the bass player said, I think I heard flying saucers last night when I was dreaming. I just, I kept hearing these sounds, they were otherworldly. Steve and I looked at each other and chuckled a little bit and didn't let on a thing. So Tony, Tony Carey, had been six weeks on the road with Buddy Miles and the Roadrunners. And Tony, Mark Aubin, and another guy, Mikko, had a group called Blessings that were signed to Epic Records. But Gary Katz was their producer and he took too long doing this Steely Dan album. So Tony had joined Rainbow with Richie Blackmore and toured all around and whatnot and he was back. And he stayed with his attorney a couple of weeks. Well then he had no place to go. So I said, come, come on to my house, I got an extra room, you can stay with me. So he did, and we worked on a couple of songs. I Need a Natural Lady, which I did in Slingshot with Steve, but Tony played a great version of it on the piano. It was kicking. And another sort of reggae song called uh, The Next Time. I Won't Come to You The Next Time. <laughs>
we recorded onto my 8-track. Well, Terry's boss knew Ted Templeman, and Ted Templeman had signed the Doobie Brothers and had just signed Van Halen. So she set up a time for Tony and I to go over and play our tapes. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? So we went over, and as soon as we got there, he got a phone call. So he said, look, I've got to take this in the back. But here's the bar, and you guys help yourself to a drink. So I didn't drink, but Tony went over and he saw some scotch and he said, oh, this is the cheap stuff. And he went behind the bar and started looking around and he found like a hundred year old bottle of scotch. So he came out and poured himself a drink, was drinking it, and finally the guy came out of the back. And when he saw Tony was drinking his hundred year old scotch, he about went through the ceiling. But we settled down and said, hey, you said fix a drink. <clears throat> and Tony said, the, the good stuff is always behind the bar. Right? So we played him the songs and he said, you know, the music's pretty good. I like the songs, but the vocals just aren't cutting it. No, nah, I'm going to pass on this. So we went back to my apartment and Tony said, well, okay, that, that does it. I'm going to Germany. I got better things to do over there. And the interesting thing was maybe three or four years later when MTV came out, Tony had a monster hit under the name Planet P and it was a song called Why Me. It was really big. Everyone loved it. Well, so much for not being good enough to make it as a vocalist. And since then, Tony's made 40 or 45 CDs. So it was getting close to the end of the summer. And before Tony left, I said, man, my relationship is on the rocks. The band's dead. Ain't no studio work happening. And about the main thing keeping me here is the Kung Fu Club. I kind of feel like I should go back to Muscle Shoals and see what I could do back there because playing on Bob Seger's old time rock and roll was pretty darn good. So he said, well, if that's all you got going for you here, I'd leave too. So I packed up all my stuff I had a new Volkswagen Rabbit. It was a station wagon, but it was a Volkswagen station wagon Rabbit. I gave it to Terry. I said, you keep up the payments. And I packed up this 40-foot truck and started driving out of town. I stopped in Palm Springs to see Bobby Zinner, the old guitar player for the force. And he was still all in a bad way because his arm had been chopped up and but I picked up some supplies to last me for the next couple of days. And as I was driving through the desert, I noticed that I was like the only hippie out there, really long hair. So I stopped for gas and I went in. It was a reservation type. Uh, I don't know what Indian tribe, but they were selling cowboy hats. So I said, yeah, I'll take this one. And I got in, back in the truck and I put it on. I said, yeah, this is cool. And then I looked and under the, under the band, it said, made in China. And I thought, geez, so much for buying a genuine Navajo or whatever it was hat. So I kept on driving and I stopped at the El Paso, Texas state line. And nature was calling, so I got out and I'm standing beside the truck and not 75 feet away from me was a buffalo. Maybe you could call it a bison, but either way, I said, this is Texas right here. And I got on back to Muscle Shoals in about two days. The whole ride there, I was thinking of everything that happened in the last five years in LA. It was like reliving the past. So that is the wrap up, although there was one more story. 
I had met a madam in Hollywood, and she had a big apartment, many bedrooms, um, and a lot of very expensive call girls. And I went there twice, and the third time she started digging on me, and we kind of hit it off, and she said, look, I'm going to, I'm closing down the business, and I'm moving to Boulder, Colorado, and I want you to come with me. I thought about it, and I said, you know, if I got there in Colorado with all my stuff, the snow and everything else, and I couldn't find a gig, I would be in big trouble. So I said, no, thank you, you're a nice lady, but no, I can't go. So be safe, be well, so long. Now there are two more stories, real short, I want to touch on before I close out. Actually, I forgot them in 1975, two events. Terry and I went to see Kiss at the LA Forum with Terry's daughter, Marcella, and Spencer Davis and his wife and their daughter. Terry was friends with Spencer's wife. So the legendary Spencer Davis from the Spencer Davis group, I'm a man, it was a great happening. And we met later on down the road. Second story, when I got back from Asia, my old friend Johnny Barnes from Boston called me up. Now, we were college buddies, and I remember Johnny playing harmonica when we were playing the war moratoriums in 1968 at the college. But he went on and I showed him, one, well, one weekend he, he said, I'm gonna take three hits of acid, I got an ounce of weed, I'm gonna lock myself in a room on Friday, and I'll come out Monday and I'm gonna know how to play the bass guitar. And from the bass, he picked up the regular guitar. And I showed him a lot of licks, anything he wanted to know. And he's a great guitar player now. Johnny hooked up with a friend of mine named Wiley Crawford, a great keyboard player, singer, guitar player, I mentioned back in 1972. And they did a song called Steel Rail Blues that got a lot of attention on WBCN. So Johnny had a deal, he had some management, and a chance to make a big album. And he called me up and he offered me a slot in the band. But at the time, I had just come back from touring Asia. I was playing with the Kathy McDonald band, fixing to play with silver, platinum, and gold, and I had to turn down his offer. Who knows what that would have been like? But there's a shout out to my buddy, Johnny Barnes. He's on Facebook, he's on the internet. Check him out, thank you. That is the end of the L.A. story, the L.A. experience. And I'll do a little bit of a recap. As I was driving to Muscle Shoals, I thought about all the musicians I had played with or met during my five years in California. I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but here is a list of about 70 that I recall. There was Steve Perry, Hubie Hurd, who worked with Billy Preston, Soko and Edna Richardson from Ike and Tina's band. With Ronnie Green, we formed Silver, Platinum, and Gold together. There was Lee Garrett, who wrote Signed, Sealed, and Delivered with Stevie Wonder. He helped me on this song. There was Charity, Cookie, and Flat Top McCrary. Johnny Graham from Earth, Wind, and Fire. Chet Washington. Dave Atwood from America. Neil Merriweather, who played bass and sang with Mama Lion and the Space Rangers. Ron Bushy from the Iron Butterfly. Steve Smith, drummer for Journey. Bobby Watson and Andre Fisher, bass player and drummer for Rufus. Carl Vickers, Jake Onion, and all of LTD. We had many great gigs with Kathy McDonald in the Kathy McDonald band. The New Birth, Bird, Fry, Robin, they were all good friends and we jammed like crazy. Neil Brodbeck, who played slide with us at the Whiskey with the Kathy McDonald band. Bobby Zamora from Reuben and the Jets. Tim Weisberg, 
Nolan Porter and Tony Powers, Skip Perkins and Captain Beefheart, Holly Penfield, Tanya Tucker, Charlie Larkey and Danny Kuchimer from this section, Donna Weiss who wrote Betty Davis Eyes, Brenda Patterson, and Domingo Sam Samudio, alias Sam the Sham, Robin Hilton from Mel Brooks's classic western, Blazing Saddles, Big John the Viking, jazz guys like Howard Roberts, Jimmy Stewart, and Dick Grove. My old bassist Dave Hayes introduced me to Van Morrison and his band, Jim Croce, Claudia Lanier, who was Brown Sugar, Mark Aubin, Tony Carey, Mark Levine, Leon Russell and Don Preston, Ike Turner and the Ikeettes, playing with Bonnie Bramlett, Gabriel Katona, Peter Lyon, Tim Dulane from Straw Dog, Bobby Zinner, Ty Grimes, Ariel Daly from The Force, Eddie Van Halen and the whole Van Halen band, Freddie from Pacific Gas and Electric, The Blues Image, Blue Cheer, Bob Seeger, Roger Dollarhide, Fee Wable in the Tubes, Eddie Money, Kenny Lover from Billy Preston's band and Gary Rice Dreamweaver, Doris Troy and Marie Franklin, Jimmy Reed, Nick Grevenites from The Electric Flag, Mickey Hart, drummer for The Grateful Dead, Tony Belson, son of Pearl Bailey and Louis Belson, Mark David Decker, a wicked drummer, Spencer Davis from the Spencer Davis Group, Spencer Dryden from the Jefferson Airplane and the New Riders of the Purple Sage, and Dino Valenti from the Quicksilver Messenger Service. These were all people I met and played with in LA. It was an amazing five years. Those thoughts were running through my head as the miles ticked off and the darkness came as I drove all night towards Muscle Shoals. That is the end of the LA story. Keep love in your heart, keep a song in your head, and I will see you down the story highway on the next adventure of the old time rock and roller. So long, friends. Where did I love go? Cool.